previously on Stay in Your Lane. Um, yeah, we've uh, we've dealt with some of the issues uh, when we've reached out directly to a shipper on behalf of one of the carriers and negotiated. You know, the carrier took a, took a loan from a broker at an elevated rate that the shipper wasn't even paying paying to the broker, and uh, we've negotiated where the carrier will eat part of the cost, the shipper will eat part of the cost, but the carrier will get something out of it to recoup some of the expense that they've got involved in it. Very good. Very good. The answer is going to be education. I mean, these guys got to do their due diligence. Everybody's got to make sure that they're checking who it is that they do business with before they take those loads. Very good. That's a key word. Slate, do you got any questions before we close this up? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out something a little different here at the end. No, I don't have any questions. I appreciate all the input from everyone, so thank you. Oh, we appreciate having you. We love having you on Slate. You need to come on more. Um, Talk to my agent. (laughs) Your agent. I'm talking to your attorney, I believe. (laughs) Yeah, he can cover (laughs) opera. Okay. So, um, so Thomas, earlier on Pat's scenario, you were representing the carrier, right? right? Now, what happens if you're representing the shipper? So in that situation, one, I, I use the same tactic of, you know, I'm not privy of contract with you. I take a look at, well, and then I use this sort of equitable estoppel school of thought. And there's a body of case law there that says, you know, the shipper shouldn't have to pay twice. They've already paid once for it. There was no wrongdoing on their part. They should be absolved. And then you also look to the bill of lading to see, you know, if you can volley liability to the consignee. Yep. Um, and, and within all of this, there are little facts here and there. Everybody's always jokes that a lawyer's favorite answer is it depends, but it does. <laughs> like, it, like these little facts matter so much in these sorts of c- scenarios because you may zig on one part where you zag on another, um, just depending on what, what is there. But that's probably generally what we do. Normally, what we what we would say is in that scenario, if you're representing the carrier and the shipper stonewalls you uh, initially, then you go to the consignee. They're going to, you know, they're normally attorney's going to go to the consignee and try and cause problems, right? Well, yeah. So the first thing I would say is, how important is this customer? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you don't want them getting harassed. How much is at play here? What's what's the monetary amount? It may end up, if it's a principal thing, you may want to have a dispute. But if it's a kind of a one-off situation, it's, you know, my advice would be get rid of it. You know, you don't want to bother the the big customer there. Um, and there is a party that ultimately has been wronged. Um, and then if there's a way for you to recover against the bad actor, right, the person who knew they were going under and took the money, illegally brokered it, whatever the case may be. Um, if you can go after them in some fashion, put your resources there and recover from them. What if the shipper knew that the their partner or broker was in financial trouble and they still continued to do business with them? Well, that's a factor, right? That, that's, a, that's a big deal in this space is the financial uh, health of the brokers and why it's important to kind of check in on that sometimes Mm -hmm. because that's usually, you know, where you start to see it go wrong, but you could have a, from the carrier's perspective, a negligent selection that that would be a fact that could factor in. I'm not saying it's positive, but it is, that's one of those little things we're talking about here that, that would make a difference in the eyes of a, a judge, you know, an arbitrator of some sort that, they would look at it and say, okay, well, you had knowledge and you're in a better position than the person running on razor thin margins. So Correct. we're going to drop this on you. It's a lot of it is about who's in the best position to sort of prevent these issues. So, Well, I, I, I think that was the key of the, of the whole thing we got to right there. Who's in the best pres- position to prevent it is the one that has the most liability. So if I'm a shipper, I then say, hey, how do I protect myself or my company or my organization or the mothership that I work for and represent. How do I protect my organization, right, from these situations? 
And this, I think, is the most important part of, the, of this because we've just shown in the same scenario, little caveats, little tidbits, little added information pieces that all of a sudden change it and change our perspective of what's, you know, who's going to be responsible and what's really ultimately going to be a solution, right? And how much. And these all these little tidbits all add up, right? But if you're a shipper and you have history that the carrier or the broker that you've chosen may be in financial trouble, or if they're a broker or a carrier that has a brokerage authority, right? Then it, the, the responsibility at the end of the day, it's not gonna be favorable for you for putting your, your organization in that type of a liability or risk scenario with someone that isn't in, in good standing financially. So the, the way to prevent this, and what I want all of our viewers and everyone to understand is, the government and the FMCSA and our federal government in the United States states that for every vehicle on the road, uninsured per day, per vehicle, is a $10,000 per day fine for not having insurance. Now, no one, I've been in this business 31 years. Pat, how many years have you been in the business? 45. 45. Slate? 40 years. Okay. Um, I think that we we all understand that we aren't going to be the very first ones to be told if someone's in financial trouble. Then, and we've never seen. Have you guys either of you seen a carrier that has been closed up by the FMCSA and fined ten thousand dollars a day per vehicle on the road without insurance? I've not. No. So here's the scenario. We are all stewards of the industry to make sure that these things are being watched, that we're policing the, the carriers, our providers' insurance, all these things. It only makes sense that the most important thing we can do to eliminate this liability is to do our due diligence on health checks, financial health checks, on all of your providers on a regular basis so that you don't get a surprise if someone's credit drops, or they're done in Bradstreet, or their paydex drops, and you say, hey, wait a minute, what happened? What's going on here? And you open up the conversation, right? If normally they pay their claims within two weeks or 30 days, and all of a sudden they're at 60 or 90 days paying a claim, then you know right then and there something's changed and something's maybe amiss. So maybe quarterly or every six months at least, uh, health checks on the financial status of your providers. Where I think in the industry and the transactional roles that the industry's headed, headed in over the past few years with software updates and things of that nature, then it's, you know, we're, we're looking to get the lowest price provider and then, well, we didn't know. They signed our contract. We didn't know they weren't going to pay the underlying carrier, right? So in many of these situations, to Jim's point of view and perspective, the carrier contract between the broker and the carrier or the carrier and the, the underlying provider is much higher than what the rate was from the shipper to the, to the provider in the first place because they know they're not paying the bill. It's going to go unpaid, so it doesn't matter. And, you know, the shipper benefits from thinking that they're going to get a lower rate as well. So prevention is what we're looking for here to not be in these situations. Financial checks on all of your providers. Slate, is that something that you do at Lighthouse? Background checks? Financial routine Health, health checks on your providers to make sure that they're financially solid and in good position to pay the providers? Well, you know, it's pretty shallow. Um, when we're vetting a new carrier, we'll, of course, ask um, deeper questions and go back in and look at their safer stat to check satisfactory, unsatisfactory, you know, withdrawn, suspended, things like that. If you don't look like you're sustainable, then, you know, we go our direction away. You know, listening to everybody talk about carrier broker situations, it's, 
you know, I don't know the difference between issues. I don't even know if it's broken out that way, but a carrier can commonly have brokerage authority. And then there's, of course, a broker. I don't know what the percentage of that fall under carrier broker because I've experienced things where I gave something to a carrier and it was their name on the truck. And when it got here, it was some, it was somebody else's completely <laughs> transferred the load over to another truck that I wasn't aware of and didn't have any contractual responsibilities to, and neither did they for us, but I've seen it. So uh, that brings us up to what the biggest liability is, I believe, in the industry, the biggest myth uh, that a an asset based provider with a brokerage authority is better than a broker. I'm questioning that. Yeah, I'm questioning it, too, because yeah. at the end of the day, uh, a lot of the problems come from that. The shipper believes and has been sold to or would love to believe that they're doing business with an asset. Right. Right. And they're not there. They're off site. They're not at the facility where the actual shipments load and unload. Right. So then they're assuming or taking that for granted when that's part of their due diligence and understanding who they are doing business with. Right. Well, they're probably making the assumption that what they're being told is correct. Right. It and may not be. And then, so then you're going to need to have two contracts in place. Mm-hmm. Correct. Uh, but at the end of the day, that's inevitably the shipper's biggest liability is a hybrid, which is a an asset-based carrier with a brokerage authority. Your liability can't be greater because they're going to haul your freight on their their equipment when they need it for their equipment. And when they don't, they're going to farm it off to, you know, someone else with an inconsistent relationship, an inconsistent track record. All of those things you're, you know, that you're taking for granted as a shipper, thinking you're doing business with an asset, and you're not really. You, you may be being told that 75% or 80% of the shipments are going on their own assets, when really it's 25 or 40%. You don't know. No, you don't. And when you have a vendor in a relationship with a vendor like that, a like carrier with brokerage authority, if they're exposing you without your knowledge, you should not be in business with them anyway. But a lot of times you don't know until it's too late. But if a carrier with brokerage authority takes your load after they've signed the shipper carrier agreement, knowingly brokers it out without telling you, and the shipper, the actual shipper, me in this case, um, the manufacturer, right? if there's an incident on the road their insurance is probably not going to cover um, your losses. Correct. Again, this comes back to a vendor, you know, potentially injuring you by making a decision that's based around creating revenue for themselves with no respect being paid back to the shipper. Correct. That's not a relationship that I could live with. Everyone, I want to say thank you for participating and and being part of this today. I hope it's been a value to everyone. And uh, until next time, stay in your lane.